shut up. <laughs> Before I begin, I want to thank my my influence uh, influences, Derek Forster Wallace and Raymond Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> hunched over a notebook, scribbling a short story. Why won't you ever let me read what you write, the wife queried, looking up from her menu. The husband regarded his wife, her pink supple skin, her bountiful mop of blonde hair, her glassy, dulcet eyes, eyes like gleaming, polished marbles. I never show anyone what I write, the husband muttered. But why not, persisted the wife. Because it's not any good, grumbled the husband. I hate it when you talk like that, chided the wife. I hate it when you badmouth yourself. It's true, though, scoffed the man. And every word I write is terrible. The husband loved his wife, but sometimes she made things so difficult. The husband loved his wife like she was some sort of magnificent rare bird. The husband loved his wife like he loved the tickling bubbles in champagne. The husband loved his wife in the same visceral way a person loves peeling the glue off of their fingers in a single large chunk after it's dried and becomes so It was difficult to put this love into words, the husband realized. <laughs> Suddenly, the waitress was beside them. Beside them, She was thin and tall with sharp bird bone features. Ready to order, she sang. <laughs> Coffee, grunted the man. What are you writing there, the waitress twittered. <laughs> you see what I mean, hooted the wife? You can't go around writing things and expect people not to ask you about it. The wife turned to the waitress apologetically. He doesn't ever show anyone what he's writing. Why not, chirped the waitress. <laughs> because it's no good, the husband ejaculated. <laughs> down on the table. The husband fixed his wife with an even gaze. The women were silent. It was 10 in the morning, but the husband was still drunk from a long night out with his blue-collar work buddies from the canning factory. Yeah! Like me! The husband was a blue-collar worker because the husband knew that there was probably something noble and romantic about that. <laughs> the waitress quickly took the wife's order. The eggs Benedict, please, crooned the wife. <laughs> the waitress gathered up their menus and left. Alone again, the time had come for the husband and wife to discuss their hideous past traumas with one another. <laughs> I felt like a failure when my parents got divorced. I felt like it was my fault, my fault, revealed the wife. Of course it wasn't your fault, consoled the husband. Your mother and father were each having multiple secret affairs. <laughs> but it seems like that's the point of marriage, pleaded the wife. You get married just for the thrill of having an affair <laughs> Are you having an affair right now, snapped the husband. <laughs> Would you just look at all of this light? The wolf, 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 the wolf
The light slanted through the glass in a beautiful way. <laughs> the light dappled the floor. The light filtered through the leaves of the trees outside, giving everything a green hue. The light glinted in the glass case near the register at the front of the cafe and made a constellation of, of diurnal stars on the opposite wall. <laughs> the light cast an aura around the little bits of dust that hung in the air. The light was a gauze sheet. The light, the light was like God's warm palm reaching down from heaven, caressing the cheek of creation. Are you having an affair? demanded the <laughs> What a stupid question to ask, huffed the wife. <laughs> the waitress brought the eggs benedict and coffee over. The husband twirled a little silver spoon around in his coffee cup so as to indicate with his body language that he was thinking seriously about something. <laughs> he was thinking about that moment from his childhood, the one that should have made everything clear to him. <laughs> he pictured his mother smiling in the kitchen, holding a basket of peaches against her hip, his father braced against the breakfast table, scowling and reeking of gin. <laughs> I ain't never wedded no darn child, the father said. <laughs> Look at me. I can't be the father of this here son. I ain't cut out for it. Just cause you can reproduce ain't mean you should. <laughs> Look at my son. He's just a copy of me, a degenerate, a second-rate citizen, and I'm a copy of my daddy, and he was a copy of his daddy. Where's it all end? The father, the father gurgles. <laughs> <laughs> the mother dropped her basket of peaches and fled the room sobbing. <laughs> what did it mean, thought the husband. What did it all mean? <laughs> he looked down at his notebook. Darling, the husband simpered. Are you or are you not having an affair? The wife reached across the table and held her husband's hands in her own. She looked at him gravely. I'll answer your question, she mewed. <laughs> as soon as you let me read what you've written. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you're going to have to shut up now. I'm so pretending. <laughs> you only get one. This is called. <laughs> I I thought about not reading this because it would be too depressing, and then I decided I didn't give a shit about your feelings. Yeah. This is called Jim Carrey Alone at Home. I do I do want to I do want to uh, make sure this Jim Carrey is a completely fictionalized version of Jim Carrey. If, if any of his lawyers are given that. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Carrey sits in the living room of his beautiful home at 615 Tiger, Tiger Tail Road, Los Angeles, California. That's his real address. <laughs> he has closed the blinds of the large panoramic window looking out over his pool with the grotto and patio bar and the tennis court beyond it. He has disconnected the 14 phones installed throughout the house. There is a man who carefully watches the 12 surveillance phone point phone. Oh, sorry. Disconnected, oh, so good lord. There is a man who carefully watches the 12 surveillance video monitors in a small booth near the gate uh, to Jim Carrey's driveway. Jim Carrey has told this man, Frank, not to disturb him at all costs. Jim Carrey is taking a personal day. Jim Carrey keeps a DVD of every movie he has ever starred in on a tall display case in his living room. On top of this display case sits the Golden Globe he won in 2000 for Man on the Moon, the Golden Globe in 1999 for The Truman Show, the several blockbuster entertainment awards, the one in 2001 for How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the one in 1998 for Liar Liar, and the one in 1995 for Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Yeah. <laughs> this is not to mention all of his MTV Movie Awards and Kids' Choice Awards and Teen Choice Awards. All of these glittering awards fill Jim Carrey with pride. He is an important, funny man. 
but Jim Carrey is not a happy man. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Carrey is all too aware of the Razzie Award nominations he received for Ace Ventura Pet Detective, Dumb and Dumber, and The Mask, all of them in 1994, a very dark year for Jim Carrey. <laughs> and did anyone even remember that he used to have a regular role on the popular television show In Living Color? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jim Carrey slumps on the couch. He begins watching Ace Ventura Pet Detective alone in the dark. He fast it's worse. <laughs> he fast forwards through the parts where his character in the movie, Ace, pretends to talk about talk out of his butt. <laughs> what have I become, Jim Carrey thinks? Am I just some sort of grotesque clown pondering or pandering to the lowest common denominator who debases himself regularly for cheap laughs? What kind of man am I? Jim Carrey takes out his high school yearbook and flips through the pages. He finds a photograph of himself on the swim team. The 16-year-old Jim Carrey stands at the edge of a pool, a towel draped across his shoulders, his arms around two of the other boys in the group. They are all smiling and sopping wet. Young Jim Carrey is scrawny and lanky and awkward looking, but he is a great swimmer. Jim Carrey remembers the silver medal he won at the state swim meet and wonders whatever happened to it why it's not up on his display case with his other awards. Has he forgotten who he is? <laughs> Jim Carrey hears the phone from one of the bedrooms down a long hallway. He has forgotten to unplug this one phone. The, answer <laughs> the answering machine picks up after the sixth ring. It's Jenny McCarthy. <laughs> She's worried about him, she says. He hasn't been himself lately. Did something happen? Jim Carrey isn't listening. I'm an artist, a thespian, he tells himself. <laughs> Why did I sell out and do my hair up really crazy and pretend to speak out of my ass? <laughs> That's not who I am. That's not the real me. Jim Carrey gets up and ejects Ace Ventura Pet Detective from the player. He finds Dumb and Dumber and pops the DVD into the tray. For a long time, Jim Carrey simply stands in front of the television and watches the movie. He doesn't say anything, just shakes his head every so often. He doesn't laugh. He can't. The pain is too much to bear. There is a storm brewing in his face. Jim Carrey walks over to the panoramic window and peeks between the blinds. He looks out at his pool. The weather is perfect. He thinks of Jenny McCarthy and what she said to him shortly before the divorce. You can never take anything seriously, she said. You're an overgrown man-child. You're, you're pathetic. <laughs> you don't understand, Jim Carrey had said. I can't stop myself. I want to stop, but I can't. You bitch, I love you. <laughs> Jim Carrey walks over to the wet bar adjacent to the kitchen. He selects a glass and a nice single barrel scotch whiskey, a gift from Jeff Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> pours himself a glass and then another. And then Jim Carrey just gives up all pretenses and drinks straight from the bottle. He looks old, he realizes suddenly. Where is the happy-go-lucky boy of his youth? Where did all of that bombast and energy go? His jowls sag, his joints ache. In the, back, in the background, he can hear the scene in Dumb and Dumber where Jeff Daniels' character, Harry Dunn, falls victim to the mischievous scheming of Jim Carrey's character, Lord Christmas. It is the infamous turbo lax scene, where for nearly 30 unbroken seconds, Harry Dunn proceeds to violently evacuate his bowels for the audience's amusement. I am nothing but a walking poop joke, Jim Carrey. <laughs> Jim Carrey does not own a gun. <laughs> Jim Carrey does not own a gun. He is better than that. Instead, he climbs to the top of his roof and looks out over the beautiful city of Los Angeles. The sun has just started to go down, the sky melting into a hazy orange. He can hear the distant traffic on Santa Monica Boulevard. Jim Carrey wishes he had someone to share this view with. His fame and money have afforded him all of the material niceties a person could ever hope for in this world. And yet Jim Carrey is a hollow man alone with his gloomy thoughts. <laughs> I am a farce now, Jim Carrey thinks. Worse than that, I am a farce's farce. Jim Carrey realizes this doesn't make sense. <laughs> he is drunk. He wishes he could stay drunk. Being drunk is such a nice feeling. 
He peers down into his swimming pool from the roof. He remembers something Mel Brooks said about comedy. <laughs> Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die. <laughs> yeah. Jim Carrey wishes someone would make a documentary of his life. It would be called The Funniest Man in the Whole World. <laughs> but instead of being funny, the documentary would show the crippling depression, drug abuse, masochism, and self-hatred he had inflicted upon himself over the years. It would be an authentic depiction of his sad, miserable life. Jim Carrey wants people to know his pain. He wants people to hurt like he hurts. Maybe it would be, <laughs> maybe it would make some people cry when they watched it, he thinks. That would be a real laugh. Jim Carrey, <laughs> <laughs> Jim Carrey takes another pool from the bottle. He toddles to the edge of the roof and looks down at his swimming pool. He is on the brink. There was a reason he got into comedy a long time ago. He tries to remember. Why can't he remember? There was a reason once. He had a purpose. He hadn't yet become this jaded, awful hack. He wishes he were back on the high school swim team again. The 16-year-old boy on the swim team who just liked to tell jokes with his buddies just because it was fun. Was it possible to get back to that? Was it possible for him to just go back to telling jokes without the pressures of being Jim Carrey? He looks over the edge of the roof again. A single step would do it. <laughs> a breeze blows and makes him rock on his heels. Could he do it? Jim Carrey reprising his role as Stanley Ipkiss in the 1994 comedy The Mask whispers to himself, Somebody stop me. <laughs>